Well, as you saw with the Fisher boys in the children's message, adoption has played a very important role in their lives. And all I can say is I'm glad Matt is young because I'm not sure I'd have enough energy to raise three boys the way uh, he and Katie are. As some of you know, adoption plays an important role in in my family's life as well. Uh, Over a period of seven years while I was growing up, we had 50 newborn babies in our house. Never more than three, but still um, always a lot of activity in our house as well. My parents were foster parents for an organization that was called the Lutheran Home Finding Society of Iowa. And it was a wonderful, wonderful chapter of our lives. Uh, We would take turns with all of the tasks involved in taking care of babies, whether it was holding them, feeding them, clothing them, uh, changing their diapers, rinsing their diapers to put in the diaper pails. Some of you remember those good old days, right, before disposable diapers where all there were were cloth diapers with safety pins. Some of these babies, uh, well, all of them we'd get right out of the hospital. Some of them we'd have for a few weeks, some of them for a few months. Some would actually be with us for several months. And it was always hard to let them go. But one of the most joyful times of all, though, was went to see those adoptive families come in uh, to get their child. And when their arms would open up to receive that child for the first time, it was just an amazing thing to behold. And, and it gave us a lot of joy, too. My mother, she had a long battle with cancer, and towards the end of her life, there was a lucid moment she had where she started to rehearse the names of those babies that we had cared for and their adoptive parents. And the whole time she did it, she just had this look of joy and satisfaction in her eyes. And uh, that was the last she, she spoke before she died. But it was just, it showed us what a special uh, part of our lives that was to be a part of that whole adoption process. One of the last babies that we cared for, uh, her name's Lisa. She's on the screen now. And like the other babies, we got Lisa right out of the hospital. And it didn't take long to realize Lisa had some real serious health issues. In fact, at six weeks old, she had open heart surgery. And then after that, she had to have some additional surgeries for some health issues that she had. My mom and dad were technically over the age uh, where you could adopt because the age limit was 35, but thankfully the courts allowed our family to adopt Lisa since we had had her basically her whole life. So she's been a part of our family ever since, and we're thankful for that. Um, Adoption has played a role in uh, my life and Amy's life too. There was a period of time of about 15 years where we had we dealt with infertility and some miscarriages and we decided maybe the Lord was leading us to see adoption as an option too and at the time we were living in Riverside uh, County California and so we thought we'd work with the county adoption agency and so uh, we began to take all the classes pay all the fees baby proof our house get our house inspected everything was in place so that we could become a foster home with the hope that we could eventually adopt uh, some children that we cared for well two weeks let me back up a second there were two boys that were actually in our lutheran preschool that were available for adoption through the system and so those two boys uh, were designated then to come to our home so that we could provide foster care and then ultimately adopt them But two weeks before they were to come to our home, the foster home that they were in got turned in for child abuse and the children were taken out of the community. And just like that, uh, it's like we just hit a wall, didn't know what to do. Uh, Months later, uh, Amy and I were in a McDonald's in Southern California. All of a sudden, here's those two boys. And they're with their adoptive parents and they're a wonderful Christian couple. They, uh, they have a ranch with lots of animals, which is perfect for boys. And you could tell it was, it was really a match made in heaven. So that helped to bring some closure for us. But it also uh, gave us joy in seeing that these boys got a wonderful, wonderful uh, family that they were adopted into. For a lot of you, you understand too that in Liberia, West Africa, adoption or sponsorship of children has uh, been a very important thing in our church we have an orphanage over there with over 50 children and i know a number of you have children that you've sponsored this is eugene we've sponsored him uh, for almost 11 years now he was the youngest orphan when the orphanage started and now he's uh, probably around 13 we don't know for sure 
but now he's kind of the mentor for the little kids as they come up. And uh, in February, Amy and I had an opportunity to go with uh, some others over to Liberia, West Africa for a national conference uh, for training pastors and their wives. And so Amy got a chance to see Eugene for the first time, which was a wonderful thing. And a joy to see just what a healthy, happy, godly young man he's become. Some of you may remember a movie. This came out like in 2002 called Like Mike. It was a basketball movie, but also an adoption movie. I don't know if any of you remember that movie. Like Mike, Mike is referring to Michael Jordan, okay? It's a story about an orphan who's 13 years old. His name is Calvin Cambridge, and he's a small uh, boy for his age. He's living in the Chesterfield group home in Los Angeles, which is a Catholic orphanage. And because of his age, he, like some of the older orphans, really wonder if they're ever going to have an opportunity to be adopted because the adoptive parents always gravitated towards the little children. That's who they wanted to adopt. But Calvin always had this mantra, it could happen, and that's what he lived by. He always held on to that hope that one day he could maybe be adopted. Well, one day, Sister Teresa, the teacher of the orphans, came home with some clothes that she gave to the orphans, including a pair of basketball shoes for um, Calvin. And the shoes had the initials MJ on them, which really uh, shocked all the kids. And in fact, one of the kids, Ox, who was the bully of the group, was jealous that Calvin got these MJ shoes. So one day he snatched those shoes and he threw them over an electric wire so that they'd be out of reach. And Calvin went outside in the middle of a rainstorm trying to climb and get to those shoes so he could retrieve them. And in the process, a, a lightning bolt knocked him and the shoes down to the ground. So he was reunited with these shoes once again. Well, one day, Calvin and the other orphans are selling candy to help raise funds for the orphanage. And the basketball coach for the Los Angeles Knights, a professional basketball team, uh, was there and bought some candy and in the process gave Calvin some free tickets for a basketball game. Calvin went with his friends and during the first half of the game, his seat number got called for a special halftime activity, which was an opportunity to play against Tracy Reynolds in one-on-one -on -one, and Tracy Reynolds was the star of that team. Well, Calvin with his MJ shoes on schooled Tracy Reynolds in one-on-one. -on -one which left Tracy very embarrassed, very irritated at this little kid, but the crowd and the coach just loved it. And in fact, they uh, ended up drafting Calvin onto this uh, professional basketball team. And the funniest thing that happened is that the coach thought it would be a good idea for Tracy to mentor Calvin and to have Calvin be his roommate. <laughs> coach knew that Tracy was estranged from his father and now he's asking Tracy to be a father figure for Calvin. Well, Calvin loved the arrangement. Tracy loathed the arrangement. He couldn't stand it. But as the movie goes on, Calvin wins over his heart. And at the end of the movie, Tracy actually adopts Calvin, and Calvin moves into his mansion with him. It was just a real heartwarming story about adoption. And yet that story doesn't even come close to how heartwarming the story is about God's adopting you and me. And what's so amazing about our adoption into God's family is we didn't have to do what Calvin did. We didn't have to win over God's love and acceptance in order for him to adopt us. And it's a good thing because we never could have. There's no way because of our sin we could ever have won over God's love and his acceptance. We would only deserve God's wrath and his rejection. So our adoption has nothing to do with who we are or what we've done. It has everything to do with who God is and what he's done for us. And that's where this reading from Ephesians comes in, where we're told, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So God the Father didn't choose us after carefully examining us for a long period of time to see, is this guy really passing the spiritual test? He didn't do that. We're told he chose us before the creation 
of the world, and he chose us in him. Look at what else it says. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his will and his pleasure. So when God the Father predestined us for adoption, it, it didn't mean God knew he would adopt us. It meant God decided he would adopt us. And he would adopt us, it says, through Jesus Christ and through his saving work. So our adoption into God's family was made possible all because of God's grace, through his choosing and through his predestining us for adoption. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the cost of that adoption. If any of you have ever ad adopted a child, you know that it's a costly endeavor. And we're going to talk about what a costly endeavor it was for God to adopt us as his children. But what I want to do today as I close with this message is I want to bring time and eternity together, first of all for Jesus, and then I want to bring time and eternity together for you and for me. So as you may know, as you look at the Old Testament, Israel is described as God's chosen people. In fact, one of the Old Testament prophets, it says, out of Egypt, I called my son when God rescued Israel out of Egypt. But because they didn't live like God's chosen people and they followed the beliefs and the behaviors of the pagan nations that were around them, Jesus would become God's chosen one in their place. Now, God had chosen Jesus, his son, from all eternity to be the world's savior. But then in time, eternity would meet in Jesus' birth. St. Paul said in Galatians, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So the eternal son of God, chosen from all eternity, stepped into time in order to save us so that we could be God's adopted children. So now the way God brings time and eternity together for you and me is through the waters of baptism. The God who chose us and predestined us before the creation of the world steps out of time into eternity in the waters of baptism so that he can declare us his chosen adopted children and receive us into his family. Through baptism, we get connected to Christ's saving work, and we're assured that we are God's children for all eternity. And that is why, as we think about this question that we're dealing with throughout this series this month of June, when we ask, who am I? One of the ways we can answer that question is, I am adopted by God the Father. Can you say that with me today? I am adopted by God the Father. Don't ever forget it. Amen.